Hello everyone and welcome back to Virtual Empower 2020. We kick off day three with an amazing webinar called Peace Building through sports and art. Bridging cultural, racial and economical divides as sport and art are both powerful tools for promoting social integration and allowing young people to creatively express themselves. I am sure there will be a lot of questions in this webinar. To moderate this webinar and introduce to the panel, we are very pleased to introduce the director of Erosian Sport at the leading French business school. A million and with more than 25 years of experience in the global sports industry. Ladies and gentlemen, please meet Professor Simon Chadwick. So, I, 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 yes, we can all hear. Hello, everyone. Yeah, so great, great. It seems, Luma, you there? You can hear me? You can see me? I can hear and see all of you. Okay, yes. so I remember a very famous Champions League game in 2005 when um, AC Milan went in at half time, uh, 3 0 ahead of Liverpool, and they thought that was it. Game over, finished, and of course, by the end of, of by the end of uh, 120 minutes, um, it wasn't uh, it wasn't their Champions League win. It was actually Liverpool's Champions League win. So I'm not going to put my hands in the air and start cheering just yet to say that we've won because I know that it's got to go to 90 minutes and then it might go to penalties after extra time as well. So I'm going to be very laid back about all of this. So can I begin by saying um, hi? My name is Simon. Uh, I'm really, 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 really sorry uh, for the late start of, uh, of of this webinar. And I noticed that Luma has disappeared again. Um, just to check, Tamara, Nasa, Luis, you can still hear me? Yeah. Yes. Cool. Okay. Somebody in Doha owes me a mint lemonade for this afternoon. Um, <laughs> but anyway, I'll leave that until later. Um, so just to apologize to everybody who, who has joined and, and as you can see, we've been having some technical difficulties. Hopefully those technical difficulties are resolved. But as I say, I really do apologize for, for the delayed start. But thank you for, for your patience. Thank you for persevering with us. Welcome to um, uh, this afternoon's webinar. I think given the late start, we, 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 we're probably going to go for about 60 minutes. Um, we won't go any longer. So I'll, I'll make sure that I keep to strict time for those of you who have to go and do other things. Uh, just to go back to, to, to who I am, my name is uh, Simon Chadwick. I am professor of the Eurasian sport industry at EM Lyon Business School in Paris. Uh, and what we have here today is, is four exceptionally good speakers, four exceptionally nice patient speakers, the kind of people that you'd want to spend your Friday with. Uh, and so without, without me going on for too much longer, the way that I like to run things is, is rather than me introduce people and get them get their titles and their jobs completely wrong, I like them to explain. So I'm going to start with, uh, I'm going to work across my screen. I'm going to start with you, Luma. So if you could just spend two or three minutes telling us who you are, what you do and, and what your work involves. Uh, my name is uh, Loma Muflech, um, and I'm the CEO and founder of uh, the Fuji's family. Uh, we started off as a soccer team in Atlanta, Georgia, uh, of refugee kids, and have grown our programming to include uh, schools in Atlanta, Columbus, and now Cleveland, um, with a big emphasis on sports, uh, specifically soccer. Um, we have uh, refugee children from over uh, 40 different ethnic groups, all the different faiths, um, and some championship teams out of that, so. I think okay. Simon, we lost your voice, but he's calling Tamara. <laughs> Me? All right, I'll go. Uh, so my name is Tamara Alatani. I come from Ramallah, Palestine. Um, I'm an expert in sports for development and I'm a PhD candidate in the German Sports University Cologne in the field. Um, I co-founded and I'm the director of Palestine Sports for Life NGO and it's focused on sports for development where we work um, across Palestine and in the region um, in sports for development, designing different programs um, designed and aligned to the SDGs, uh, specifically education, health and well-being, gender equality, um, and peace, inclusion, and so on. And we'll talk more about that at the moment, too. I'm really happy to be here alongside distinguished guests. 
And um, thank you so much for the opportunity and for the organizers of this conference. And I'm happy to um, yeah, engage with everyone who is watching. Thank you. Hi, Sam. I can read your lips, but um, yeah. Hello, everyone. I'm, I'm also pretty much glad to be part of this um, uh, webinar. And uh, also thank you for the organizers for the invitation. And I'm the consultant curator for the Qatar Sports History in the project of the Qatar Olympic and Sports Museum. And I'm also a professor in the Pontifical University Catholic of Rio Grande do Sul. Uh, I'm here in Brazil right now. And uh, my, my research always, uh, it's, it's in more in a historical and social cultural perspectives and in the Olympic studies. So I've been working for these different cultural initiatives and, and, and consulting from them and also making this bridge between sport and culture. And I'm um, really happy to, to join you here today. Okay, thank you. NASA? Thank you, Simon. Um, and yeah, so my name is Nasr Al Khouri. I'm uh, with Generation Amazing, which is a, a social and uh, human impact uh, legacy program uh, under the um, Qatar 2022 World Cup uh, Supreme Committee. And uh, the idea is that um, Generation Amazing basically empowers uh, young uh, people in the region, uh, mainly looking at disadvantaged youth, uh, refugee populations, and IDPs. Uh, through sports and specifically football, so it's um, it's a like it's 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 a legacy project that started uh, in the early stages of the bid for the World Cup uh, by the state of Qatar, and the idea is you know ten years down the line, uh, today we've been able to reach uh, five hundred thousand um, youth across the Middle East and Asia, and the idea is that um, we also uh, decided from our senior management that um, this initiative will continue as a legacy beyond the World Cup. Um, so that the Generation Amazing um, is currently transitioning into a foundation uh, which will last you know, beyond uh, the World Cup. And our target is to reach 1 million uh, beneficiaries by December 2022. Um, and uh, so that's sort of uh, Generation Amazing in a nutshell. Um, and I would also like to thank uh, Empower, uh, Rota, Education Above All, for providing us this uh, opportunity to um, have this panel. And uh, and I you know I would like to thank also our panelists uh, that have joined us and Professor Simon thank you for moderating. Thank you, thank you. And just to extend my thanks, can I say thank you to everybody who's in the room at the moment, um, everybody in the audience, and also to our speakers, uh, and and also to uh, to the Supreme Committee, Generation Generation Amazing, and others. Um, just just to just to say to the speakers, if you find yourself you you drop out of this. Uh, you may need to refresh your page and you should uh, you should then rejoin us. So that, that's just in case. Um, the other thing as well for the audience, for people who are listening, if you do have a question, we'll try, we'll try to, to, to weave some questions into the session this afternoon. Um, it may be a little tricky given that we're short for time, but please do, if you would like to ask a question, um, then you can post them in the uh, in, in the chat facility. But I want to begin, and, it, and perhaps if I can direct this to, to, to you, uh, Tamara, I want to begin by talking about each of your individual projects. Um, and I guess then to broaden it out more generally and, and to think in terms of what, what were the goals of your pro, what, what have been the goals of your project? And, and what do you think some of the impacts of your project have been? So Tamara, if we could start with you. Yeah, sure. Um, so basically taking the context of Palestine um, and the decades of political and economic pressure that it's in, it fragmented the communities and divided them so here comes the role of Sports for Life uh, organization to connect uh, the communities and the importance of these programs. So um, our program's short-term impact, let's say, that it's building the relationships between the different communities that we have um, as a result in Palestine and giving them hope um, that there is something positive uh, in, an, in a, an inclusive environment um, and also giving them uh, an, an environment to promote uh, tolerance and uh, respect and understanding. And this, of course, while we are um, giving them sports programs uh, where we are using sports as an entry point um, to, um, to you know, communicate them and let them learn the different uh, life skills and also raising their awareness on different social aspects. 
So um, once these programs are like these community uh, programs that we are working with um, in cooperation with the Ministry of Education and with UNRWA, specifically uh, since these community programs are for free, so they are running after school hours for everyone who can connect uh, and come. So um, we have more than one uh, community that is coming to these programs. So these programs on the long term are, are building uh, it's a safe place to build these relationships, to have these discussions between the different uh, communities, to change the different perspectives and the, the different mindsets that are labeling different uh, communities. So this uh, program, it kind of um, gives them this uh, environment for an inclusive environment. For those youth that we are educating them to be the, the agents of change in the long term in terms of bringing uh, and providing an env environment of uh, peace and tolerance and understanding and respect. I can't hear you. <laughs> okay. Yeah. I just saw that uh, I had a question there. I will also, everybody can access me through our other medias afterwards. Okay. So, so, I, I guess you can hear me again. Yes. Yes. Okay. So if I go silent audience, I'll refresh myself and I'll come back in. Just to pick up on that very quickly, Luis, um, if people are posting questions in the sidebar and any of our speakers feel able to answer those questions in okay. the sidebar, then please do that. I'll come over to you, Luis, if I may. Yeah. So Luis, your project, what have been the goals? What have been the impacts? Okay. So yeah, I'm, I'm as I said, I'm consulting curator for uh, Qatar Sports History in a project of the Qatar Olympic and Sports Museum that is uh, planned to be open in next year, 2021, in Doha and Qatar. So, um, before going directly to your end, Simon, what's, what's important to us understanding here is that, of course, as we are a project that has a vision, so we are more we have we have more perspectives of what could be our impact and what is planned to be our impact in the long and short term as as, as you imagine so the question is what is the role of a, of a sports museum and an olympic museum so that's that's something that uh, have been uh, placed for many years and and what what when we call this connection between art and sports we have to understand that art not only as art as like a high art or, ex, uh, or as an expression of high art, let's say painting the sculptures. But we are more thinking as a, as a cultural practice. And this is how we also understand sport. So when we think this as both expressions of, of, of a community, so this is when we connect them as both a sport practice. So when we think of the role of the museum on this, and on, on, when we think on this, and by the way, we are all here thinking on sport and art, just because in the Olympics, the founder of the modern Olympics thought that we should connect the sport and art. And this was back there on the early of the 20s. So he said, if this, there is a connection that we have to think that sport and art. Of course, he was more romantic, more romantic idea of the Greeks, but what's important that this legacy that we are now here in this in this room talking about, it's it's placed from him, from him and this idea that the Olympics, they, they are more than just a sport and event. And this is what makes them different from any other events. They have a cultural perspective. They have an educational perspective. So when we think as a museum on an Olympic and sports museum, we think in this perspective, that we are also a place to educate. So we are a place that we would like to then shape, reflect, and, and debate with the people what are the culture um, uh, that the, this community are, are, are talking about. So regarding to, to a specific the galleries that I work with that's related to Qatar sports history, the idea is to go beyond of what we were seeing uh, more or less or being seen in terms of stereotyping what's the role of sport for Qatar within the community and through over the world. So, this initiative is a global initiative to Qatar from, from the early 40s, when starts, let's say, the first clubs to today as a global player. How, how this comes? So the idea is to present that and to the people understand pretty much how, how we can connect this and what is the, the role that Qatar is playing 
within the sports world through our also uh, a museum uh, perspective and a cultural perspective. So I, this is just like for start our, our conversation and I don't want to go beyond. And we, we did talk about that, that you have to cut us to other dogs all talk, but then just you, go, go on. I think that's, that's also good. pass the ball, the ball for the, the next player. Hey, I, I'm, I'm, as a manager, I let my players express themselves. <laughs> okay. Uh, can I come to you? And, and obviously, Nasi, you're, you're working with our hosts uh, or one of our hosts today, Generation Amazing. But could you, could you tell us, for, for people who don't know about Generation Amazing, could you tell us more about your goals and also tell us more about some of the impacts that you've had? Uh, yeah, sure. So, uh, um, so Generation Amazing basically, uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, was established during the early stages of the bid uh, for Qatar for the World Cup 2022, um, almost ten, uh, about 10 years ago in 2010. Um, and the idea behind Generation Amazing was that it is a social and human legacy program that uh, positive, positively impacts the lives of uh, many disadvantaged uh, youth in the region. Uh, obviously, back, you know, 10 years ago, um, into around 2010, there was the sort of this, you know, um, the revolutions happening in the Middle East. Uh, Syria was, you know, under the, you know, a lot of people were sort of, you know, there was a lot of refugees leaving Syria, uh, fleeing to Jordan and, and neighboring countries. So the idea is that we wanted to use the power of football and, and sp sports in general, but football specifically, uh, to help and to create sustainable social uh, uh, change in these communities. Um, so, uh, and, and the aim is that we want to reach 1 million uh, youth uh, through football and through our football for development programs uh, by the end of 2022. And uh, I, as I mentioned earlier, we're targeting disadvantaged and displaced uh, youth in the region, but also we're expanding now globally. Uh, we're launching our first uh, project in Africa and Rwanda uh, with the government of Rwanda. Um, and we're establishing sports uh, facilities around a rehabilitation center that takes uh, kids off the streets uh, due to you know drug and abuse issues um, and then puts them through a, re a six month uh, rehab program um, and we're supplementing and complementing that um, rehab facility with sports for development and uh, to date we've been uh, we've built um, 30 community football pitches across the middle east and asia um, and you know, we develop football pitches uh, or refurbish existing uh, venues or facilities in, in some of the places to create safe space and safe space for kids to come and play and also learn about football for development. Okay, thank so, you. Thank you, thank you Nasser. Yeah. Well, you, sure. you, if you, you want to continue? Yeah, I was just going to say okay. that we also, you know, besides the, the venues that we built, there's always that, you know, program programmatic elements that we built for the community. So. What we like to do always is that we try to empower uh, the young generation and, and young leaders in the community to transform uh, the community around them. And that way, like we're also creating sustainable um, uh, change uh, using football for development and empowering local um, participants and volunteers and coaches from that community to lead the programming. So it's not always us that's, you know, pushing these communities and, and supporting them. At some point, you know, there's always that um ownership piece where we give everything back to the community and then the programs kind of uh, continue to you know um we provide support of course but we try to empower people on the ground to lead uh, the mm -hmm. program mm -hmm. okay thank you nasa now i'm going to ask the, the question sus suspiciously knowing the answer luma are you with us yes oh you are there luma we can't see you but we can hear you would you would you mind if we ask you that question even though we can't see you yeah, sure. It's, sure. Yeah. So, Luma, so Luma, a two-part question, as with the others, is 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 uh, what what have been the goals of your organization, and what have been some of the impacts? You know, I think um, you know we start off as like a pickup soccer game in a parking lot. Um, I just got to play with some kids that I, I had seen. Um, so initially, there was no intention on what this could be. Um, and then when you know the, the kids I met wanted to start a soccer team, and we went around. Uh, all the adults in the community were like, you can't have a team with all different ethnic groups. You have to pick one, like work with the Somalis or the Liberians or the Bosnians. They're not going to mix. And I was like, are you crazy? Like soccer, everybody wants to play it. They're going to mix. Um, and so we ended up getting kids from everywhere. They all wanted to play. 
Um, and at first they would stick in their own groups. You know, we have kids who are from warring factions on the same team. We have Sunni and Shia, Hutu and Tutsi, um, you know, Karin and Rohingya, and everybody's on the same team. And they would initially just want to stay with their own groups or not mix with groups that they are taught to hate. Um, and then we lost the game. And that was the reckoning and pointing out to them that if you don't play as a team and you don't learn to trust each other, you are not going to win. Um, kids want to win at any cost. So if they needed to learn to trust each other, that was a really good like carrot. Um, and then the work began of teaching everyone to learn about each other and respect each other and build on their commonalities, build on their common identity of having to flee their country, um, of having parents that are struggling to make ends meet, um, but see that as a strength and what they can contribute to society as a whole. So at first it was just to play and then it started building bridges with cultures and then it became a way for us to motivate our players to do well in school. Um, and then we became ambassadors. Like when we play, and I think the United States is different than the rest of the world. In the United States, soccer is a middle class, upper middle class white sport. Um, and then you see this team coming in, every racial group, um, you know, shattering stereotypes um, and then taught by a woman, it just like throws people into like this um, crazy make -up. This is not the soccer team I expect to see. And then they're really good. Um, so in some ways our impact has grown to what we initially thought it would be. Um, and, and our tools have developed as well. So. Okay, thank you. Now at that point, as I, I think just to interject personally, uh, I'm looking at the, 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 the sidebar, the questions, and again, if any of the, the, the speakers, whilst you're sat listening, you would like to reply to any of these questions, feel free to do so. But what has struck me already about the people um, sending in questions, you know, Abdul Salam, we've got Amar from uh, Nepal, we have Kamran, Roxana, uh, Kristen, Adil, uh, who else? Ahmed, Ab um, Ab Abdul Rahman, Luis, Tariq, Adil, and many others who are sending in questions. Uh, so who said that sport doesn't bring people together? We're, we're all here from all over the world uh, talking about sport on a Friday, which is a great thing. Um, so if I could just move swiftly uh, along and, and, and come to my second question, uh, and that is, um, what have been some of the challenges that you have faced, some of the most important challenges that you have faced in the work that you do? And go back to Tamara and, and, and ask that question. How, how has it been with you, Tamara? What, what, what are those challenges that you've had? It's basically working with different contexts and different communities. So, and also then freedom of movement in terms of being able to you know implement the different programs in uh, different areas of Palestine. So you always have to have a plan A up to a, a plan Z for you to be able to implement anything. That's basically uh, a very common challenge that we have here. But in, and the fact um, in terms of um, you know getting the people to understand the mindset on how you can use sports as a tool to influence or educate and have or develop their life skills it is a long process it's not just you cannot do it within with a one-off event or with a one-off program a one day thing it's a long-term process but with sports you can shape the personalities and develop their different or their attitudes and behavior uh, towards each other and this takes some time they have a common language which is sports but at the same time how can you measure that it's about putting the different indicators and putting the different uh, aspects that is, uh, you know, designed for the same context that you're working with. So for you to be able to measure the change of behavior, it's not something easy, but it needs a sustainable program for you to be able to, uh, to really measure that. Um, so to have this continuous follow up to build a kind of self reporting system for measuring that. Um, but we are working all the time and continuously by empowering the youth um, that are working or like the trainers, the youth trainers who are training the next generations, that they are uh, building together this system where we can really measure um, the different changes in the behavior and attitude and bringing the communities together. 
at the same time we are always connected so we have a kind of network of trainers that these are the the people that we have uh, built their capacity we are always connected and added throughout the years so whatever updates we have or any best practice then we are able to share it together and discuss it and so on but it's a challenge to have um, a, a certain you, know, you cannot take the same model and put it uh, anywhere else it's a matter of understanding uh, of where you are uh, applying your program and what you are measuring in a whole different context it's different from each context and that is a challenge but it is doable that you can really put the effort and educate uh, the people there and let them be part of it for you to be able to really measure the impact and changes okay thank you Luis, I've got my I've got my phone with my uh, timer on it, Luis. So your time starts now. Don't don't, don't take too long. <laughs> it's okay. It's okay. Um, yeah, I also want to thank you. The, the all the questions that most probably I will not be able to answer all of them here, but I also had add my my address on on it on, on the social media, so I, you can can address on that. So I I think um, as I said, I work for um, for a cultural institution. And, and when we think on this, um, uh, the impacts and, and in, in order to us measure, I think the legacy, and I think this is one thing that we should take into consideration, is uh, we always have tangible and intangible aspects. So when we think like more in the tangible aspects in, in, in terms of culture and art, uh, we, we might say like, okay, this is a painting or this is a, or, or this is an initiative. So it's something that are more concrete. But when we think on intangible aspects, then we think more towards how we are addressing people's behavior, attitude, or how can we look into them uh, and, and see this more as in the context, as Tamara just uh, uh, said. So uh, as a museum, we, 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 we have to think that we have a role in, in, in reflect and also bring to the debate, especially all these aspects. So we, we think on, 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 on the initiative that we're taking in the past and we look into them in their context and we see which of them is still progressing or is still developing, what were the changes in being while? So why they are changing, why they get involved, why they involve other aspects. As I just mentioned in the beginning, what is important to think that um, the Olympic movement itself, it, it's all based on a perspective that we have to develop not only uh, sport excellence, but also sports values, the Olympic values, or, or, and, and this also directly connect with the art perspective. And here, as I said, art in terms of cultural. And so we, can, we cannot think just only that uh, we are looking to, to promote um, um, people to develop their, their artistic skills, but we are thinking on them more in terms of a cultural development. Or when we say cultural development, we think more of how sports then it's, it's in, uh, applying uh, as, as a community um, aspect uh, to bring people together to different, different uh, as, as, uh, as, as Qatar that has a multinationality uh, place, how, how these people are involved in sports in different perspectives. So when we think in all of these, we have to think in programs and educational programs within the museum that also support the different aspects that, for example, they are display on the permanent exhibition. So we think more as a museum that it's a, it's a, a long-term perspective of educate people. And we haven't seen now in the, the, the last uh, uh, social movement, especially like Black Lives Matter and everything. And we have the, all the, the, the social movements that sports are involved within the Arab world and the Middle East. So this, this has to be a place they have to to be uh, the uh, debate and the museum is a place where we can reflect about this so it's a cultural institution that also can bring a debate beyond a result of a sports event so beyond of what we conquer as a as, as, as a nation let's say so we have to think of what are the other initiatives that with sports, it's going not only in terms of elite sports development, but also in grassroots sport development. 
what is the role, what, what, what really sport is impacting the people. And this is working with culture. And when we work with this, then is when we fulfill our role as a museum as well. So we are part of a system of education. And this is something that is quite important to, uh, especially in Qatar, that we are also developing like a museum scene. So we have art museums, but we, for example, as a sports, we are not an art museum, but we are a cultural museum. And this is something that it's important to people understand that sport is part of the culture of any community. Okay, thank you. And just to say at this point, for those of you who have not been to Qatar, Qatar really does have some truly stunning uh, museums, just to, just to, to add to that. Um, NASA, if I could come to you and, and ask you the question as well, is, is uh, what have been some of the, the, the challenges you have faced with Generation Amazing? Um, yeah, so I would say, you know, some of the challenges is um, that we faced over the last uh, couple of years is um, measuring uh, success and uh, impact. Um, as you know, the programs that we deliver are um, short term and it's usually, you know, we follow, we have a training program and we have master coaches that, you know, uh, train people on the ground and um, you know, kind of, and then, you know, they, those people in those communities, the volunteers would sort of go back to the community and deliver to the youth um, the football for development methodology and curriculum that we've uh, developed. And so over the last couple of months, uh, we've been working very closely with um, our sister legacy project, the B4 Development, which is a behavioral insights um, uh, legacy uh, program under the Supreme Committee for Delivery. Uh, and Legacy, which is the World Cup uh, 2022 organizer. And we've, with the B4D, we've been able to use uh, the theory of nudge uh, and nudge exercises to test the behavioral, uh, you know, be behavioral changes in our participants that go through our uh, program and sessions. So, um, you know, with the coaches and the participants in, in Qatar, we started, uh, and Oman as well, uh, we started doing um, surveys and reflection and uh, cards and puzzles. Uh, like a before and after sort of, uh, you know, exercise to, to measure the impact. And it's been very interesting to get those results, uh, to see the, the changes in, in people's behavior over a very short period of time. Um, and then in addition to that, we've also partnered with the UCFB um, based in the UK. Um, and the partnership, uh, we signed an MOU with them last year. And uh, what we did with UCFB is that we had our inaugural uh, youth festival that, uh, in, in December 2019 uh, in partnership with the Qatar Foundation and Education City. Um, so we developed a youth festival that uh, rang alongside uh, the club's World Cup in December 2019, um, where we had youth participating from uh, over 10 countries uh, and then obviously youth in Qatar as well. And the focus of the, of the of the conference or the the, uh, the, the festival was uh, football for development, obviously, and then we focused on gender equality through football. And um, it was really interesting to see that we actually had more uh, female participants than uh, male uh, participants in the festival, which was, uh, and a lot of them came from Qatar as well and the Qatari community, which was superb. And, um, you know, this is something that uh, US, UCFB helped us sort of to look at the impact and measure the impact of the youth participants over the, sh the five uh, day period of the festival. Um, and that was very interesting. The report is uh, going to be published very soon on our website. I'd be more than happy to share it uh, with all of you on the panel. And um, also, if there's a way that we can share it with the moderator to share with the participants on this uh, this webinar, we could we could do that as well. Um, and then obviously, you know, uh, currently we've been able to reach 500,000 uh, beneficiaries in 10 countries, uh, Qatar, Oman, uh, Nepal, Pakistan, Jordan, uh, Lebanon, the Philippines, and we're also expanding, as I mentioned earlier, to Haiti and Rwanda and India are some of the countries on in the pipeline. Um, and you know, we we try to sort of um, continue, you know, to create a sustainable model where uh, the community kind of uh, leads and has a sort of buy-in and uh, on the program. So in case, you know, it was not always the case that we're going to continue to support and continue to be there. We, we kind of encourage people on the ground and empower youth uh, to lead. And um, that's some of the challenges that we face. But, you know, uh, over the biggest challenge, I think, is, is the sustainability of, the, of our programs. Um, but, but we've noticed that, you know, creating sustainable change uh, takes time. 
and uh, empowering people on the ground and giving ownership to the community is the best way to create uh, a sustainable model. Okay, thank you, Natha. I, I just want to kind of take a, a little time out there, a little time out, and, and move away from our established schedule because, um, firstly, I, I, I'm going to highlight Donya's question. Uh, I like Donya. Donya Al Kassar, I like your question, Donya, about um, can, you give, can you give us a good example of, of something that you've done? Uh, so, Tamara, Nasa, Luis, I'm, I'm not going to ask you that now. I'm going to come back to that later. And, and ask you the question: If if you if if you had to give one example of you of something that you think worked incredibly well, and and was very effective, what was it? But I'll come back to that question. There was somebody else who asked a question which I I I, I liked as well, and and I'd just like to take a, a brief interlude here to 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 consider this is, uh, and I'll come to you tomorrow with it first. Uh, what about COVID-19? How, how has COVID-19 impacted upon you? And, and what kind of challenges do you perceive it will have for you moving forwards from here, Tamara? Yes, of course, the pandemic has affected us as it has affected everyone globally. But we are trying to uh, adapt um, through it. Um, so what we have done as programs uh, to keep our youth involved and connected because it is important to maintain their well-being, uh, their mental health, and uh, you know their well-being. So what we did is trying to bring online um, resources and uh, uh, classes to raise their awareness about COVID and protection measures. So this is one of the things that we have done on our website for a complete two months, where we had daily uh, sessions of sports sessions that are accommodating for different target groups so that they can do the sessions uh, together and also then come back to the recorded videos at any point. We had nutrition um, also aspects for them to learn more about uh, health uh, protection measures. At the same time, we are aware that there are some communities that do not have any internet access. So what we did is that through our network of trainers in the different villages and in the different uh, uh, refugee camps that we uh, were able to distribute of course, with different uh, international organizations, uh, such as Common Goal, for instance, that we were able to distribute different, um, you know, uh, supplies, health supplies, um, and also medical supplies in terms of masks, hygiene, uh, all of these things, uh, taking, of course, all the protection measures uh, for the refugee camps, as well as, um, uh, you know, uh, advocating for uh, keeping active in, in sports because it maintains the, um, you know, the health and well-being. Uh, in addition uh, to that, uh, for instance, we just had recently, two days ago, we went uh, to the Jordan Valley, uh, which is a very difficult area at the moment. Um, and the youth there have very many different uh, aspects and perspectives in terms of COVID. So the, what we have also seen through the past four months, the lack of awareness towards uh, the pandemic. So what we are doing is that we have, together with coaches of uh, cross continents, um, using the curriculum and adapting it to what we have as well in, um, in Palestine, to the context of Palestine, that we have adapted those games um, to raise their awareness about the myths and facts about COVID through sports. So for them, that was important for those children in the Jordan Valley where we also distributed because they don't have these resources in terms of the prevention of, um, you know, health uh, hygiene supplies. So connecting the sports and um, hygiene supplies to raise their awareness, but also keeping them active and um, maintaining their well-being. So okay. this is how we are trying to adapt all our programs and also keep our youth and um, trainers connected through the different social platforms for those who have access and the ones who don't have access that we send our trainers to them uh, taking of course um, uh, the protection measures into consideration okay thank you tamara luis for you oh. how has COVID affected you yeah i, I would say in terms of uh, opportunities so uh, as we as i said we are a project in, on, on developing so um at, 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 in the, at this stage that we are in going to crucial stages of development, um, the, this affected uh, as, an, as an opportunity that came to launch as more uh, uh, the museum digital presence. 
So, uh, so this is how uh, the museum uh, faced this, uh, this moment, uh, looking into what we now can provide at this stage. So many museum institutions turn into their digital platforms. And as the museum had to speed up this digital presence, so towards to the Instagram, as I just put on, on the chat, the, the museum uh, developed uh, different initiatives exactly to in order to people become, or not become, but uh, trying to keep their active lifestyle uh, during the, the pandemic. So, so the museum joined this movement uh, that was not just only uh, in, in Qatar, but worldwide. Uh, that institutions that uh, look into their digital presence, and, and this is something that we you can also think as a tool from your question before, that, that the digital presence is quite important in this sense. So the museum look into this as an opportunity to, to put in place a development of uh, educational problems in terms of nutrition, uh, physical awareness, and, and this is how uh, the pandemic directly affect the development of the museum is to speed up some of the process that probably will take place in, in the coming uh, months and, and, and years, but then to put in place right now because this is the moment that it was needed. So this is uh, something that was uh, directly uh, affect, uh, affected at, at, at this moment. So NASA, um, can I ask you the same question? COVID, how has it impacted upon what you're yeah. doing? Of course, yeah. So it's been a, an interesting couple of months uh, since the pandemic started. Actually, we were uh, in Georgia a couple of days before the lockdown, and we had uh, we were with Tamara, and we had an excellent meeting and, and discussing a couple of initiatives that we wanted to do together. Um, but you know, obviously, because of the pandemic, a lot of our face-to-face -face and delivery uh, method on the on the pitches and in school programs had to stop. Um, and so we decided to transition and deliver a lot of these sessions uh, online and virtually. And so we activated uh, our accounts uh, on social media and we created the hashtag uh, GA Live, which has been, has been able to reach, I think, 18.5 million uh, views uh, over the last couple of months, which is, I mean, amazing. And uh, we also have, um, you know, we've, we've also, what we've done also is, is that we have uh, currently under the Supreme Committee for Delivery and legacy, um, we have ambassadors that represent uh, the, the organization and other 2022. Um, and these, some of them are also FIFA World Cup uh, legends. And we've been able to do live chats with them where they come and, and share some of their learning experiences and um, inspir give inspiration to some of the youth um, that are sort of, you know, tune in on our, on our live uh, sessions. And they get, they also get to ask uh, questions and they get to engage with some of these uh, legends where, you know, this opportunity is very unique and otherwise, you know, they, they wouldn't be able to, to do this. And we've also done uh, a couple of things actually with uh, the Olympic Committee, uh, sorry, the Olympic Museum, uh, Qatar Olympic Museum and the team also, and the other museums in Qatar, uh, when it comes, you know, to the Children's Museum, we've done uh, a book reading, uh, you know, on uh, uh, you know, uh, football and, and girl, uh, girls in, in the region. Um, so we've done a lot of these activations online and we've also delivered sessions uh, to, you know, sh very short, you know, 20, 30 minute uh, football for development drills that, you know, parents and kids can do from home to stay fit and active. And it's been interesting, the, the feedback that we've been getting from parents as well and from people that engage with us online. Um, and it created some sense of uh, routine also for a lot of people that, you know, have you know, schools that have been disrupted and people working from home, you know, these sessions, you know, that run sort of four days a week, uh, every day, 4.30 p.m. Doha time, this kind of created like a sense of uh, routine for a lot of people. And um, and I think that was a, that was a great uh, advantage. And I think we're going to continue to do these even post uh, pandemic. Let's deliver these sessions online and continue these chats with stars and try to inspire people because I think at the end of the day, um, accessibility is something that we care about and we want to be accessible, you know, the most accessible as possible and reach, you know, the wide, you know, uh, the people all over the world. So this is kind of the best way. And all the, all, everything we do online is, is free as well. So anyone can tune in and go through the, the sessions and join the chats and interact with our, you know, with our stores and, and legends online and stuff. So I think this is something that we learned uh, is, you know, is very impactful and we want to continue to deliver these sessions post-pandemic.
I'm going to go back to um, the the questions uh, from our from our script, so to speak, um, and really begin to think in terms of the dynamics of of, of and, and the relationships within programs. I think it would be important at, at this point just to, to emphasize for, 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 for perhaps for some people is obviously the focus of this afternoon session is is termed or labeled peace. And, and, and peace very often implies conflict. But I think there's also much more to this afternoon session or the premise uh, to this afternoon session is much broader in terms of um, reconciling differences or trying to reconcile and understand differences between different nationalities, between different ethnicities, between different genders. So this is this is peace in terms of social cohesion too. So it's not just about conflict and peace, it's also about social cohesion too. And so in those terms, and, and again, I'll come to you tomorrow to begin with, is um, when you have these situations of conflict or you have these situations of misunderstanding or you perhaps have these situations where there's a lack of respect between different people or different groups um, how do you manage that what what do you do with with the the dynamics of that relationship to to try and make them better yeah we have that a lot basically here in, in Palestine where there isn't this social cohesion let's say between the different uh, communities um and what we are trying to do or what we are doing actually in the past 10 years now with sports for life is that our com our community programs are always open for everyone so whenever someone joins the program um the other participants do not know directly the the different backgrounds so in sports you do not have this kind of labeling uh, uh of the different communities so this kind of brings uh, or gives a safe space where we have the different uh, understanding or like a, a sports game. You can play football or basketball or anything uh, and you don't have to ask about the background or so on. We're playing a universal language uh, and so on. But what we have in our system or in our curriculum or in our programs, which we are always training our different trainers, um, is to understand uh, or basically before that a step that all of these trainers that we are training are coming from the same community that they are training so we are not bringing someone from outside to deliver a training inside a different community but rather one who is from the same community that's one example where then we have the neighboring communities coming so they understand the com context the programs are delivered in participatory with the with the participants and above all is the discussion and reflection that we have at every single exercise or drill there's always a group in the end a reflection method that different reflection methods that we have at the end of each practice where we connect what what, what happened in the game in terms of skills or in, in terms of the drill itself um for instance um, how did this uh, team manage to do a certain uh, drill if they if they would do it again they would put a different plan etc but at the same time, then connecting it to the to the uh, life setting. As an example, I would go for um, a camp that we did, a leadership and conflict uh, resolution camp that went for eight days. And I think it was one of the um, best um, things that we did in terms of bringing the communities together. So it was uh, um, an eight days camp in the same place. So the participants had to sleep over that came from across Palestine. So we had 80 youth coming from villages, refugee camps uh, and cities, uh, north, south, mid, you name it. So everything, like every single community that you can think about. Of course, at the start, it was very difficult. Uh, as you mentioned, um, it, it, there was no social cohesion whatsoever. Um, but through sports and through the models that we have used, that we were able to to let them have that pl platform of discussion a safe space to empower them to speak to discuss and come to an understanding and have that respect and tolerance towards each other by the end of the eight days although it was very short but we were able to bridge between those com different communities and although this happened at least three years ago they are in connection to today and they are the ones who are then advocating for you know different uh, mindset than the one that is actually there 
and what played a role in this is sports. So this is just a, um, a sample uh, example, let's say, uh, towards how we, through sports, just giving them a, a platform with respect and education and empowering them to be able to discuss the different uh, changes and reinforce the values uh, that they that we are always talking about, just reinforcing them through sports and then on field and off the field, because that's how it, you are going to advocate for change uh, and the difference in having that social inclusion and cohesion in the communities. Okay, thank you, Tamara. Luis? Um, well, that's a very, very interesting question, Simon. And, and I think Tamara uh, touched on a very important point that the social cohesion and community uh, building especially in the context that we have multinationalities or a directly conflict within a, a sort of cultural uh, uh, identities. So I'm um, thinking more in a broad sense, not really just with the museum and also answering some of the questions is uh, when we think about a, a sports for a peace uh, building and in the sense of peace building of uh, mutual understanding. That's that's the, the basic ground here that we have to talk. It's like a mutual understanding. And when we think on this, is developing not only sports for um, uh, elite sports, but also grassroots sports in the sense of educational sports. So whatever uh, um, uh, program you're thinking on develop, you have to think on develop this program more directly related with an educational tool and this means that it have to uh, have an, an, an a program how to educate through sports and there is different toolkits available uh, especially in the olympics platform that you can find and, and and this is something that you can think about and think on museum directly we have to think that museum is a place that you learn from the past and thinking and looking to the past we will see that there is different examples that we can showcase mutual understanding, cultural understanding, um, and, and, and how sport play a role in different contexts and in different situations. I'll just give an example from Qatar. So uh, we are Nasser already told about, about the, what's going on now, but Qatar from the beginning, it's a showcase of how to, 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 to address a different a multinationality or different uh, identities within a place. So the first club of Qatar in 1948 that was built within the oil company premises, it was called Ithad al-Arab, which means all Arabs together. So it was already an understanding that uh, sport could be a place of getting this different community that were there in that time, that the, the, the national identity of Qatar was still not really that in place. So, so this was a really important because we know that especially in football clubs, we can develop the clubs within their own cultural uh, 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 agendas and, and identities, and they also serve as a room for conflict, so that they promote certain types of identity against another one. And uh, within thinking this, we already have to think that sport can be also a place for conflict, but also a place for understanding. So when we think on, on, on different strategies that the different um, uh, uh, governments or institutions had placed along the time, and we display this for the people, people might understand who they are within that community, how they are represented, how they, they, they can debate, how the debate is open or not. So the, the museum, and when we bring this, as I said, as a cultural institution, it's a culture where we reflect ourselves, we can understand ourselves, and also we can shape this for the future based on, on past examples. So this is something how we, we, we are looking to that. Okay. NASA, just your input in, in terms of uh, managing the dynamics between these different groups of people who may not understand each other or maybe in conflict yeah. with each other? Yeah, I mean, you know, one thing for us is that, you know, um, as, as an organizing uh, committee for the World Cup uh, 2022, um, you know, the legacy component uh, has just, you know, has been just as important as the tournament itself. 
Uh, we've been working with, you know, as Generation Amazing plus other legacy programs under the Supreme Committee. We've been working with uh, global partners, uh, you know, to harness the power of football uh, to stimulate, you know, human, social, uh, and economic uh, change and, and development. And uh, you know, both in Qatar and uh, in other countries across the world and in the region. And um, you know, the program Gen Generation Amazing itself is built on the belief of the you know people that you know can achieve social cohesion and communities and you know the willingness to cooperate and work together um, at all levels of society is something that we all sort of achieve you know through our programs and, and we believe in as well on a daily basis and that's sort of the you know all of all of us are under that impression and understanding and, and all the programs that we deliver um, and it's essential you know for us as generation amazing to ensure that you know the the social inclusivity of everything we do and, and when it comes to our participants and beneficiaries uh, to feel, you know, a sense of uh, safety, belonging, uh, you know, well-being, acceptance, uh, recognition as well uh, through the programs is, is something that we, you know, you know, uh, emphasize on a daily basis and, and we, we promote as well. Uh, and that's, you know, that's just, that's Generation Amazing, but also Qatar as a nation. Uh, like Luis mentioned, you know, um, the, the, the World Cup, you know, FIFA 2022 has always been a regional um, a tournament. It's never. It was never just about Qatar and about you know Qatar hosting the World Cup. It was always the Middle Eastern World Cup, and you know the first time that the World Cup comes to the Middle East. And so I think that alone is just an example of of how you know football itself and you know the power of football to bring people together and to unite societies is uh, is 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 uh, you know incredible. And I think you know one example that we have that I would like to share is with our partner club uh, Kas Oipen in Belgium. Uh, so, with the, you know, when we visited, uh, when we had the initial conversations about the partnership, uh, they identified that there's a lot of refugees around uh, Oipen that, you know, uh, recently moved into, into the neighborhood or the community in Oipen. And uh, the club itself wanted to, to be a facilitator or sort of to bring these people into the, into the club to, to sort of, you know, create a more cohesive society. And uh, we designed uh, an initiative with Kas Oipen, uh, which is called Team Integration, which is basically a team that brings uh, the refugees uh, to the club to play football. And we created this tournament that was launched uh, prior to the pandemic. Um, and obviously, you know, now it's it's currently on 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 hold, but you know, uh, it will be sort of um, um, you know restarted again once you know people can go back to the club and and, and practice on the pitch. But the interesting thing is that, you know, other clubs like Leeds and Sheffield uh, United have reached out to us and really like this concept and they want to kind of deliver, uh, develop a similar concept in their communities because of the refugees around, um, you know, the, the, the club itself and to create a cohesive so society. So we're now in conversations with other clubs uh, as part of the Generation Amazing Network uh, to create something similar. Uh, so that that's just an example of how you know football again can you know bring people together and create a, a more cohesive uh, society. Okay, thank you, NASA. I'll do it one last time, Luma. I'm really sorry, Luma, um, that we've not been able to involve you more. Uh, we've got a relatively short period of time. Uh, it's it's three minutes to the top of the hour in my part of the world, and I'm guessing in quite a lot of uh, uh, of the rest of the world too. So if I could ask you just very, very short and sharp, uh, I'm going back to Donya's, uh, Donya's question, which is um, Tamara, uh, Luis, Nasa, something that you did, so, so as part of your work, as part of your program, something that you did that worked incredibly well, and why did it work well? Just very, very short and sharp, 30 seconds. And I'm delaying just a little bit to give you the opportunity to think about those examples. Um, so short and sharp, something that worked incredibly well. And why do you think it worked incredibly well, Tamara? Well, um, I think the sports for development approach that we are able to teach others to use. So basically to increase the network of the ones who are using that program. So basically, if we, uh, but I will give an example. We have in Tulkarem, one of the northern cities in Palestine, where it wasn't, um, uh, there weren't too many opportunities for uh, young girls to play sports and specifically football. So through our program, we were able to uh, build the capacity of a young um, woman there who was really passionate about football and um, built her capacity in how to deliver uh, football for life skills 
Um, so basically delivering different social issues and developing the life skills of youth. So in two aspects, I would say it was a real success that that happened like six years ago, but now she is uh, breaking the stereotype of women football, uh, basically coaching 80 boys. Uh, and also that um, we started the first um, women's football team in Tulkaram uh, for Sports for Life. So including at least uh, 25 young girls under the age of 18 playing in the league. Uh, so for them in that area was an important aspect to come to a safe place and have that opportunity. In addition to developing or cooperating with universities to have the ones who are um, studying uh, sports to have this internship with Sports for Life in that approach, because this is not a well-known approach at that time that they learned this approach and we increased the base of, um, of trainers over there. In addition, and lastly, to connect with the Ministry of Education and UNRWA, that we are building the capacity of the teachers and the social workers in both the systems, so both the governmental system and the system that is working with the refugee kids to use sports as a development tool um, to build um, bridges between communities and everything, but also to incorporate it, this is the next step, that we incorporate it in the curriculum um, of the system that is used, or like the educational system here in Palestine, at least. It has been done in Jordan and Northern Iraq together with the GIZ over there that we were able to develop the different curriculums. And that is a huge success that we have been able to convince that you are able to use sports as a tool um, to tackle different social issues. So that's- okay. Thank you, Tamara. I'll not penalise you for your, for going over your sixty seconds. However, I, however, however, I, I will penalise Luis for going over sixty seconds. <laughs> Luis, your sixty seconds. What did what have you what did you do well, and why did it go so well? Yeah, um, I, it, it's 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 quite um, straightforward. Uh, um, memory preservation project. So when we look into the people that did or people that are doing, we're just uh, listening what Nasser was saying about what, the, what, what incredible work they are doing, or even Tamara. So the memory of people that did a lot of projects or were an activist or were people that had an impact on your society. So these people, they, need, they, they deserve to their memories be preserved in a sense that in another context in the future, people might want to understand how their people were thinking and why they took that decision at that time. So developing a memory project that we use a lot, the, the, the methodology of uh, oral history. So then build these uh, archives and then this di you know, and today's digital archives that you can uh, afterwards uh, uh, present and reinterpret this and, and, and the people might be more, have more awareness of how these different people, they live together, they, they, they build together uh, different communities. So um, a memory preservation project uh, is it's one of the, the major tools I, I keep using in cultural projects. Okay, thank you, thank you. And NASA, finally? Uh, so I something have to- good, something, you, something you give, okay, something yeah, good that you've done and, and why? Yeah, so obviously the football for development, uh, as you know, Tamara was mentioning, you know, I, I'm just going to share one success story that we had and we're very proud of. Um, it's uh, it's from a young uh, woman in Pakistan. Her name is Mahira Ahmed. Um, so Mahira Ahmed also came to the Wise uh, the World Innovation Summit on Education Conference last year in Doha and shared her experience and journey with the, with the delegates of the conference. Uh, in 2013, Mahira was 19 years old. Uh, she founded uh, Women as a Nation, which is a non-governmental organization that focuses on and advocates for um, youth, uh, specifically um, women education and equal rights for girls in Pakistan. And uh, soon after she started working on this uh, initiative, uh, Mahira received a lot of uh, um, death, death uh, threats, both her and her, her family members as well. Um, and then, you know, Mahira's, you know, work focused on getting girls uh, into schools, um, which I think caused a lot of uh, controversy uh, in, in her community in, in Lari. And so, um, so she kind of, you know, stopped, uh, stopped for, for a while. And then she joined, uh, two years later, she joined uh, Generation Amazing through our partnership with Right to Play. And she became a, um, a youth uh, facil field facilitator with uh, Right to Play. 
and um, through the people that she met through on the program and, and the, the coaching that she received, she decided to reignite uh, Women as a Nation and the work that she was doing. And um, and as a result of like all the work that she's been doing to put girls back into school and in her community, um, I think over like three dozen uh, kids, you know, young girls kind of went back into school and, and, and it was a great success. And, uh, and last year, Mahira received uh, um, an NPEACE award by the UNDP Office of Pakistan, the United Nations Development Program. And she was also uh, recognized at the UN uh, GA in New York in last September. Um, so that's sort of a, 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 a nutshell. I mean, that's just a, one success story out of many others that, you know, uh, you, you young people kind of, um, you know, through the Generation Amazing program decided to kind of create their own uh, initiatives and, 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 you know, they were empowered to to change, uh, create social change in their communities. Okay. Thank you, Nasa. Um, at that point, I'm going to start to draw proceedings to a close. I'm really sorry that I have to do this. Uh, obviously, we did have some technical issues at the beginning, and, and so that delayed us a little. But I realized that people may need to go to another session now. Um, I think some of the some of the participants today have left their contact details in in the sidebar, and I'm sure they would welcome you uh, contacting them. Um, I'm not going to summarize as such other than just to say, Luma, I don't know if you can hear me, but thank you. Thank you for being ultra patient and uh, tolerant with us. Uh, but otherwise, to say to Tamara, to Luis, to NASA, thank you uh, for amazing insights into what I think is a, is a really, really important part of certainly the work that I do. Obviously, sport is very often associated with competition and conflict and uh, adversarial relationships. And, and I think we do tend to forget that it plays a very, very important role. And as we've I've sat been been sat listening to it, I think even when I was a kid, you know, and even the kids in the next street who we didn't know and we we didn't know their names, we didn't know what they were interested in, you know, they were different to us somehow. Um, but we always got together and played football. We always played football in the streets together. And and so I think for every one of us throughout our lives you know, sport has a very positive and a very profound effect upon us and i think thanks to the work of people like tamara luis nasa and i'm hoping luma who uh, can hear us um you know, i think it's thanks to people like you that that sport is even more powerful so thank you to you uh, our our speakers thank you to the people who've been in the room today uh, thank you also special mention to the organizers because i think some of the it organizers of all of this was, <laughs> they must have been sweating quite a lot for quite a while at the beginning of this uh, webinar so thanks to, to them as well and, and i wish you uh, a good day no matter where you are and a, and a great weekend a great remainder of the weekend depending upon where you are and hope to see you again thank you thank you so thank much you. Many thanks Professor Chadwick and all the speakers for that very informative discussion. So many useful and impactful ideas to think about. We will now have a 15 minute break before our next session of workshops which you can join from your dashboard. Places are taken on first come first serve basis. So make sure you give yourself enough time to review the topics and languages. Choose the one which suits you the best and join the workshop on time. See you there.